Evening, everyone, and welcome to Geopolitics with Tiberius D. Of course, I am yours truly, and I'm here with our good friend Yori. Say hello, Yori. How you doing? Hi, I'm Yori. You may have noticed me from the last episode, or the episode that you're about to see now. I don't know how it got uploaded, but I'm still here, being quiet, adding very little to conversations. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm Yori. <laughs> Yori's actually a really good friend. He's actually been a really great help, and I appreciate it. We're going to be talking about Norway today. And um, I definitely could have had an intro that I could have thrown in here, but I'm still working on that. I think we're going to do those more for Season 3. But I did notice that people did comment that those interludes, those um, opening starts are very much liked. People kind of want to go back to it, but the pause is what gets everybody. Which uh, we're looking to get some music into the show uh, so if you want to, if, if you're a producer, if you know any kind of person that you can give me a little tune that I can inject at the beginning of the show, that would be great. And, uh, feel free to contact me with that. We'd really appreciate it. Remember that Geopolitics with Tiberius D is brought to you by our wonderful patrons list of Zen, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Andrew Wagner, the West dude and, uh, Ladybug. We appreciate your guys' sponsorship and continuing the wonderful time that is Geopolitics with Tiberius D. Forgot to do that in the promo in the last one. I really am terrible. Getting terrible. Um, I'm still all groggy, so there we go. Uh, I'm going to blame it on the grogginess. Let's talk about Norway. Uh, talk about Norway? Yeah, let's talk about Norway. Um, here's the problem. I don't think this is actually going to run to full time, so we'll actually not blast this one out. But the last two times I thought we weren't going to, we end up doing so. So, right. Yuri, what's the first section here, buddy? All right. So when did Norway enter the modern era? When did this happen? This, this amazing opening of gates. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, not only a when but a how, right? Um, okay. So when when Norway kind of modern enters the modern area, it's actually under the, uh, excuse me, under the leadership of Sweden. I want to rewind here a little bit, and go back to the way ancient days in the 1300s, or maybe even earlier than that. Yeah, there was once neat. something called the Colmar Union, which basically had all of Scandinavia part of one general uh, political alliance. It was actually um, what we call a political union, where a king or a ruler has the throne of multiple countries at the same time, but they're not noticed, they're not formally recognized as integrated. The Colmar Union was. The Br the king of Denmark, yes, tiny old Denmark, which actually was quite a bit a little bigger at the point at the time, owned the throne of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, all at the same time. The difference between then and now, Sweden had control of Finland, and uh, it, it was uh, basically it was the north uh, the North European super state uh, for a quick minute there. Keep in mind, this is at the end of the feudal era, so it really isn't a state in the same way that it is. And it, uh, the same way that the Anglican Empire will break apart under Henry II or after Henry II's death, this will happen to the Colmar Union. The first one to get its independence is Sweden, because Sweden is way bigger than all the rest of them. And the Swedes felt like that they weren't really... Uh, they wanted more of a national leader, somebody who spoke their mother tongue, that kind of thing. And they eventually were able to force the issue to where they, they had their own king again. Norway would eventually be able to follow, follow suit, although I don't remember exactly how that happened, so I apologize. What, what does happen to here is that you fast forward and that the Swedes will eventually lose Finland to the Russians in the Great Northern War. But Norway will actually get brought into the Swedish fold. They will literally um, have a, a co-rulership co in institution there. I don't remember how that happens. I apologize. But when we enter the modern era where uh, we get into the 1800s, Sweden and Norway are part of the same country, officially. Uh, it, it's actually a nice little, like, double-headed, um, weird-looking thing where... Um, um, excuse me, uh, chat, chat was going off of me. Oh, crap. Uh, excuse you me. Good? Anyway, um, right. losing my mind here. Anyway, um, <laughs> Norway was in a personal union with Sweden as far as I, as far as I have this, this correction. 
Norway will eventually get its independence, and I'm thinking about the 1880s, but it might be not later until about 1900. I apologize for being a little sketchy on this. I probably should have read up a little bit more. I know the general theme, but there's a few details that I'm just not specific with, because quite honestly, Norway doesn't matter too much in history. Uh, we'll talk about why in the geography section, but in general, until very recently, or more particularly about World War II, Norway just doesn't get on most people's radar. But we'll fast forward this. Going into uh, the era of World War I, Norway, which I believe is actually still under Swedish control, which now makes me feel really stupid for what I just said. Um, <laughs> Norway is still under Swedish control, or at least I th it, it very soon or very recently it got its independence. It'll stay out of World War I completely. Uh, all the Scandinavian countries will. Come World War II, though, we see the first time that Norway is actually noticed. And Norway is a functioning country, independent as of this time. Norway will be invaded by the Nazi Germany in the early parts of 1940. I believe this is, uh, like, uh, March of 1940, which... Pick a good time to invade. I mean, it's cold as crap up here. Um, Denmark is literally wiped out in uh, about six hours, and Norway's more or less fun knocked out of the war within a week. There's uh, some scattered fighting, but most of the capital and uh, major major military and population centers will be controlled within three days, and most fighting is over within a week. We'll still see some engagements around Narvik and some back-of-the-woods insurgency, but for the most part, Norway's knocked out in short order. After World War II... Uh, is over, which Norway is actually one of the only allied areas that isn't liberated outright. The the Germans are there at V or at VE Day, so they actually are f more well peacefully deoccupied at a point. So you don't even have to have uh, the allies invade Norway to to liberate it. Uh, Norway has serious issues when it comes to its geopolitical security because they know that they're now a target. Um, it's not that they are super important so much that everyone wants to attack them, but they know that if anyone needs to, they can with re with very little effect. Of course, who's on the block? The Soviet Union, which Norway is the only NATO country, or I'm sorry, of the, of the original 12 signatories of NATO, if I have this correct, Norway will be the only one that will actually have a border on it with it. Um... I think Turkey joins a few years later. Um, let me double check that just to make sure. I, I apologize. I don't remember exactly uh, where I'm at here. A little, little, little uh, busted. Norway is an original signer. I don't think Turkey is. Yeah, Turkey Turkey signs three years later. Um, double one. Wanted to make sure get my facts straight. But... Originally, Norway is one of the 12 original signatories of NATO. They actually are the only ones that will have a functional border with the USSR. Norway sees that as a massive threat and is why they sign on a, sign on to NATO. The real issue with where we're at more in the modern era is that with the Americans basically defending Norway as part of the North American Treaty Organization, as far as where um, the geopolitical situation is for them is that they're able to develop their Norse social democracy that so many of our leftist friends like to tell us about and how we should be more like them. It, it, it kind of lacks detail. We're, we're, we're basically looking at a country that while it has the population of a modern city state, it's quite sizable, but it has massive geopolitical institutional barriers that is really, really hard to operate in isolation. Basically, or, or, I'm sorry, as a collective whole, uh, the basically the history of Norway for the last 30 years is basically more or less maintaining a, give or take, like a, a semi-operable semi-state, where you have Oslo, which is obviously the political core in the capital, and you've got a few knickknacks here on the side that regards to... Uh, Bergen, Narvik, and I think there's one other place that really kind of matter here, but they all vary in importance. The chat just hit it where I haven't got a chance to get there yet. The big thing that really blew up and it started about in the 1980s is that people realized that there was a bunch of natural gas outside of, um, outside of, uh, excuse me, 
batch of, a bunch of natural gas out, out in the North Sea. You had to offshore drill it. took a lot of money. took a lot of expense. But as technology developed and people figured out how to rig up their, their oil rigs against the, the North Sea, they were able to do that more and more and actually put it, Norway on the map as an energy, in, as an energy um, producer. In fact, that is why primarily the... Um, Norway has been able to fund its social demo- social de- or social democracy is that it, it takes the oil and natural gas exports that the that the country can produce within its territorial waters and it's able to sell it on the open market with um, basically the same way that Alaska does for its UBI and provide social programs for all this country or for this country without that I don't think that we'd really have, be having this conversation about how Norway is this advanced social democracy this is the only way they can pay for it there's not enough people to have in a mass economy of scale even though they're part of uh, n- numerous European institutions is that they're too much of a backwater to really matter in most regards in fact reminder that most of the companies that run these oil rigs aren't Norse the British a lot of it's BP. Trondheim, actually, yes, is a fantastic uh, point there. That's one of the major uh, hubs. Um, it's Bergen, Trondheim, and Oslo are the big three. Narvik's kind of on there, but it's kind of lost some of its geopolitical importance. So, you have any uh, questions on history from the chat or from Yori? None at all. Not at the moment. All right, fair enough. Thank you, chat, for uh, helping me keep on track. Always appreciate it. Uh, we'll move into the next section, which uh, I believe is geography, is it? Yes, it is. What is the geography that empowers Norway? Doesn't empower it. Uh, just, just as a as a given factor here, uh, Norway is literally the I, I called it in the title card the stairway of ice. It is more or less a airy. Uh, it's so weird. Norway's geography is basically very, very mountainous. It is literally an entire mountain chain that formed into a country. Honestly, it should be part of Sweden, but because it's so mountainous and that its people are so separated from the Swedes, they haven't become Swedes. It's very, very similar to what we see in more mountainous parts of the world, where the geography is so intense that it doesn't allow cultural diffusion to the point where they see each other as one another. Um, we can talk about this in Mexico, Afghanistan, and um, areas of the Balkans, and, um, excuse me, what, what's the other place here? Um, uh, the Caucasus mountain ranges. Basically anywhere people can hunker down in where they can't really get be reached out and touched they, they tend to hold on to their identity far better than people who are on a plane. And that's actually the problem here, is that while there's not a lot of Nor- Norwegians, the, um, the problem with um, Norway is that it's really, really hard to connect to the wider world. Give and take. By land, you really can't invade it without a fight. You, you, most of it's just going to be an attritional warfare kind of thing where you literally just have to like, walk through the mountains. What is really, really good for Norway, the only reason why it's it's a major note of, of any kind of worth is that it is, um, particularly our geography is very weird and that they have what's called the fjords. Now, if anyone is not familiar with what the fjords are, they are more or less these valleys within these mountain ranges that actually have in, in, or sea inlets. And so they actively make natural harbors each and every place that they go. You literally, um, I'll put it this way. It's kind of like a wine bottle, if you will. You've got a, you've got a narrow opening at the front. Sometimes it get, it's just a jagged place all the way through. Sometimes it opens up into more things. And it literally sits between a mountain. Anytime a storm rolls through, you literally just roll up into one of the fjords. And you, um, you just kind of camp out. And, uh, one of my good friends in chat just pointed out how, like, the, the, uh, the Germans use the fjords to house U.S. or um, KMS turpits, um, which which gave the Allies a lot of trouble in World War II, and that's absolutely true. Uh, they they used quite a bit of the Northern Fleet and um, of the uh, excuse me of the German fleet of uh, the surface raiders. Most of them would be actually deployed into Norway after 1940, and because that was the best way to use that. You had all you have these numerous numerous 
geological harbors that are naturally formed that you can basically hide stuff. Um, you can hide stuff in uh, in these little corners, and you can literally just roll in and roll out of different ones, and there's hundreds of them. Literal hundreds. Um, and so... The, the geography basically boils down to this. By climate, it's horrific. It's cold as crap, and it's even worse because it's in the mountains. Um, the second part here is that there's no real flatland. It's not an agriculture producer. It's not any kind of... Uh, it's the only extraction service that it has is oil and natural gas, which is more of a more recent development, definitely starting with uh, the late 70s, definitely into the 80s. 90s and now where we're at today is that it produces quite a bit of energy but without that it really doesn't make any kind of significant geopolitical impact outside of positioning um and so more or less the geography is a handicap and the only reason why it matters is because strategically as a military matter it is a, it is significant enough with certain advantages with the fjords and with um, a, basically places that you can kind of lock in yourself, that it is a good staging area to operate in areas throughout the North, North Sea region. That's its geography in a nutshell. So, give or take here, Norway isn't really empowered. It's more of a target, and even if it's even with that, it's a limited target. So, um, quick questions from the chat. Is, uh, is it the World Seaback steward under the ice in Norway? Yes and no. Um, when we think of Norway proper, it is not in Norway proper. The World Seaback is on an island about 600 miles even north of Norway proper. It's well above the Arctic Circle. It's actually uh, in a very similar location to Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. But it's, this, it, it's, a, it's a large island that's formerly recognized by Denmark, or I'm sorry, uh, by, by Norway, that uh, the, the sea bank is on. It is very cold. Um, basically, it's its own natural freezer. It's that cold. Now, there is a chat about if they're going to have to do something because of global warming, but that's probably 30 years away. So we're not terribly worried about it right now. Um, sea bank is kind of a weird conversation to have anyway because it's basically like the world's best Doomer project. Um so it'll be very interesting where that goes. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions about the particular geography or any notes that they want to add, feel free to do so in chat. And Yori, if you have anything, feel free to add so as well. Yeah, no, I don't have any questions regarding the um, geography. I'll probably have more questions coming up in the next segment, though. Absolutely, sure. So do you want to go ahead and move on? Uh, I'm going to give it about 30 more seconds for the chat to actually fire off something. If I don't see it, then we'll, we'll, we'll definitely move on. Um, I do appreciate everyone for being here, and I apologize for not being at the top of my game. Um, working as many hours a week that I do, between paying my bills on a average basis, and then coming here onto the show to do what I do, I'm very thankful for doing it, but it's also, it's 65, 70 hour weeks. It's a lot of work. And um, it takes a lot of time. And so I, I, I sometimes drain myself out. Now, you guys can definitely tell episodes where I'm doing better and episodes where I'm not. I hope to be more consistent one day, but we're just not there yet. So moving on to the next part. Go ahead. What's the future of Norway? It's a great question. What do you do? Uh, the future of Norway is probably like what we've seen quite a bit in its past. Um It's not significant enough to where, um, it's not significant enough to where I think it's going to be a major, major, major target for any kind of imperial world order. But because of its oil and natural gas exports, it's going to be a. I don't know how to put this. People are going to be paying attention to it. Um, what you, what I'm looking at here is what is the relationship going to be with Central Europe. What is France going to do in regards to Norway? What is Britain going to be doing in regards to Norway? And what is Germany going to be doing? Now, Britain, while owning most of these oil export or these oil platforms, uh, as with BP, which is formerly a British company, I don't think they're going to care too much because they're far more likely to become a British or I'm sorry, an American protectorate. 
if um, if things continue to going the way they're going. France looks like it's eyeing more of North Africa, so it does it doesn't look like it's going to reach out and touch. And Germany, right now for the moment, is actively eyeing being in a good relationship with our, with the Russians for once, which is just um, it's weird. We've been here before; it doesn't usually work out, but hey, you know, I guess they'll give it a shot. Um, I would say that the most likely future for Norway in a nutshell is number one, it's going to be a protectorate of Sweden. Um, the Swedes will actively say that for better or worse, they're in it together and Norway's fortunes and Sweden's fortunes are more or less completely intermingled. If one happen, if something bad happens to one, it happens to the other or puts a, each other in a very serious threat. We could see another World War II situation where somebody actually te goes out and hits Norway, but I don't think the Swedes are actually going to be so neutral the next time that something like that happens. I could be wrong, but um, basically anything that Sweden would need, particularly in reforms of energy, it's right next door in Norway. That's a big conversation to have. It's not 1920 anymore. It's not, you know, a world powered by coal. It's powered by oil and natural gas and... What Sweden needs, Norway has. And so that that might be interesting. The The one that I'll throw in here is that if the German-Russian relationship does go to crap and there's a very good chance that it can, Norway's a target for the Germans because it has a lot of the energy that would actually keep Germany online for a limited fashion. It's not enough, but it's enough that it's worth every bit of investment to come in to seize those assets. And in a more imperialistic world where everyone's looking after their own interests instead of these multilateral trades, trade deals and uh, institutions, Germany is absolutely a threat to Norway. We'll have to see a Germany that rearms to do this, uh, but maybe they can even do it on an economic alliance because holy crap, the Norse would get stupidly rich off of selling to middle Europa. But I'm going to table that largely for now and simply say that I, I expect the future... Of, um, of Norway to basically be a toss-up between who is actually going to run the show there because they can't, they're not strong enough to do it themselves and sooner or later, whether it's a security issue, an economic issue, or a political issue, somebody's probably going to show up and say, look, you're, you're under my protection. You're part of my aegis. Uh, you're going to sell to me and I'm going to defend you. And that will probably be the relationship with Norway with somebody. Obviously, most likely Sweden, most likely Germany, depending on where that goes. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't, I don't have too many questions. I thought I would, but I just I don't. All right, fair enough. Um, I definitely didn't hit the timing that I was uh, expecting to to some degree, but I knew this was going to be a short one. It's um, it's not that Norway isn't relevant. It's just more that Norway is, it doesn't have the scale and the importance that we're going to see coming up in the next couple episodes, particularly Sweden and Finland. Sweden obviously is like the, the North, the Northern juggernaut. It's got a long history. I'm going to, I'm going to blow the history section out with that. Finland, not so much. It's going to be a lot more like Norway. So as we moved into Norse week here, um, I hope you guys enjoy it, but Obviously, Sweden's going to be the gravitational center here. Um, maybe I should have done a collaboration with, like, Iceland or whatever, but this is Norway in a nutshell. So uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. If you want to watch all these other episodes, you can find that on YouTube or continue looking through the playlist that is this podcast. If you guys have any comments, criticisms, questions, please, I want to hear them. I, I have quite a bit that is thrown out for me from time to time, whether it's a YouTube comment or a uh, Twitter post or what have you, but I would like more because I know definitively that there's quite a bit of my audience that listens but that doesn't say anything, and I would really like to know a little bit about who you are, what, what you guys like about the show, that kind of thing. So I really, really appreciate it if you guys want to join in and if you really, really want to help me, I'd love to have you as part of the patron team. It makes my job easier being... <laughs> what the what the world? Excuse me. Uh, thank you, chat. Um, 
it would make my it makes my job easier the more that you guys help me out. I understand money's tight. Maybe if you guys are Americans, you have that stimulus money, you can throw me just a itty bitty bit of that. I would appreciate it. Um, we're definitely doing some more investments and working on how to better this show. So I want your opinion. I would like your support. And on that note, thank you very much for watching Norway. We'll catch you next time, guys.